I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each conversation, I talk to two readers about one novel, and together, we summarize the story for you. We'll introduce you to the characters, tell you what happens to them, and we'll read from the book along the way. And at the end of our conversation, I talk to our researcher, Ted Schwartz, for EndNotes. Ted always has something interesting to tell us about the novel and the author. So, if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Today, I'll be having a conversation about the novel, The Giver, by Lois Lowry. And I'll be joined in conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. Joan, Patrick, hello. Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. Joan, Patrick, before we start our conversation today, let me read a brief introduction that I wrote for today's novel, The Giver. Written by Lois Lowry and published in 1993, in The Giver, Lowry tells us the story of Jonas, a 12-year-old citizen of the community and the newly assigned receiver of memory. In an effort to not only eradicate pain and war and starvation, but to eliminate even the memory of such things, the community has created a safe but bland world where choice, individuality, and even weather has been controlled in the name of sameness and equality. But in a world where the loss of memory can mean the loss of war and starvation and pain, it also means the loss of good experiences. As the new receiver of memory, Jonas is tasked with receiving the generations of eliminated memories from his mentor, the giver. How Jonas receives the memories of war, snow, and the color red, and what he does with information no one else but the giver knows, makes up the bulk of our novel, The Giver, by Lois Lowry. Patrick, with that introduction, let me ask you, is this the first time you've read The Giver? No, Frank, I've read it a couple times over the past three or four years. Has your impression of it changed since the first time you read it and the last time you read it? Yes, it has changed a little bit in relation to some other books that I've read since the first time I read The Giver. Patrick, I place The Giver in the grand tradition of utopian novels where at first impression it seems like a utopian society, but the more you read, the more you realize this really is dystopian in its existence. And I'm glad you put it in that category, Frank, because the book is usually categorized as young adult fiction, but I think it shouldn't be limited to that age group. Absolutely. This can be read by anyone of any age. Joan, let me ask you, was this the first time you read The Giver? No, it isn't. And of course, I agree. It's one of those utopian books, but it's really good at bringing you into this community that you think is normal and nice. And then you keep reading the book and you realize that's not a world that we know or want to know. I totally agree with that. In our early discussions, you referred to rereading the novel as peeling back the layers of an onion and more and more of the core was revealed. The first time you read it, the story sort of washes over you. But the second time, you know what's going on. And so with each sentence, you can see how this part of the community is being revealed to you. This rule, how it affects their life, is being revealed to you, and so on and so forth. Patrick, it's a testament to Lois Lowry's ability as a writer that within just a few pages, she creates an entire world that is beyond our knowledge or even our understanding. Right, and she does it so well. You're drawn in, so you say, this seems very familiar. This is mm -hmm. not science fiction here. And then it's slowly revealed to you. And I'm glad you mentioned that it's not science fiction. This is really just a story about well, it could be anywhere USA. Oh, I hope not. In fact, not only is it not science fiction in that sense, if anything, the technology of the book has regressed from our time. The main mode of transportation for the citizens in the community is the bicycle. Right, and yet they do have scientists, they do have cars, and they even have planes. That's right. This is not an agrarian or rural society, but it is a controlled and safe society, and bicycles have been determined to be safer than cars for this community. And really, it seems to be working for them. For about the first 10 pages. All right, Joan, let's start the way the novel starts. Introduce me to Jonas. Jonas is on his bike, riding to his dwelling, and he's thinking about how he's feeling because he thinks he's frightened, remembering one other time in his life when he was frightened, and that was when there was an unidentified aircraft flying over the community. Well, Joan, why was Jonas so frightened about a plane flying overhead? Well, because when that plane flew overhead, the voices from the speakers told everyone that all of the citizens are ordered to go into the nearest building and stay there immediately. And Joan, just that quickly, we realize we're not in anywhere mm -hmm. USA, are we? Definitely not. Well, Patrick, had Jonas never seen an airplane before? Well, yes, he had seen cargo planes landing in a distant field across from the river, but jets had never been allowed to fly over the community. Well, do we find out what happened? We do. Shortly afterwards, the speakers come alive again and announce that everything is okay, but that a pilot in training had merely made a mistake in his navigation. There was nothing to worry about. The pilot would be released 
and everything was safe. Joan, the pilot was going to be fired? Well, it seems like it's a little bit more than being fired. Jonas knows that to be released from the community was terrible. Even the kids on the playground couldn't joke with each other about being released. Well, Patrick, what's happening now that would remind Jonas of the last time he felt so frightened? Well, after giving it more thought, Jonas actually decides that he's not frightened but apprehensive about some December ceremony that he's sort of looking forward to but is a little unsure of. And actually, it's a strange sentence that Lois Lowry gives us. She says, all of the 11s were excited about the event that would be coming so soon. And it's the next scene when Jonas is at home with his family, his mother, his father, and his sister, Lily, that we continue to get the feeling that this society is just slightly different than one that we're familiar with. Well, after dinner, the whole family stayed at the table and discussed their feelings, which sounds lovely, until you realize that This is a rule of the community. Everyone must tell what they felt that day. Right. So what could be sort of innocent, so, you know, how was your day, honey, Mm -hmm. and how was your day at school, has been ritualized or codified into this mandatory thing, which seems odd. Jonas's sister Lily tells a story about another group of sevens that visited her child care group that day (laughs) and how she got angry at one of the boys because he didn't follow the playground rules. Uh, She got angry at one of the males. Right. That's right. One of the male sevens. She never calls him a boy. No, we never hear a girl or a boy. That's right. But she's mad at this male seven for not obeying a rule. Right. And Jonas jokes with her that this male seven must have been acting like an animal. And we think it's funny. Yeah, it seems sort of right until they tell us that they don't really know what animals are. Well, it does seem funny until you read the next sentence. Neither child knew what the word meant exactly, but it was often used to describe someone uneducated or clumsy, someone who didn't fit in. Right, and it gets odder, Frank, because... At one point, Lily, a couple years younger than Jonas, is waiting for her parents to give her her comfort object at night before she goes to bed. Her comfort object? (laughs) Right. Well, it's a stuffed animal, and yours is called elephant. And you can have it while you're seven, but when you're eight, they take it away. Right. Things have very literal, sort of lexical dictionary definitions for what they are. Mm -hmm. And Joan, the feeling that we're not in Kansas anymore continues when the parents talk about their jobs. The father is a nurturer. Mm -hmm. What does he tell us about being a nurturer? Well, he was responsible for all the physical and emotional needs of every new child during its earliest life. New child? Apparently, there are 50 new children born to the community each year. And it's their father's job to take care of those children for their first year. Where's the mother and the father? Well, we learn later there was a birth mother whose job it is to give birth to the babies, but she has nothing to do with the children. The children are placed with the nurturer until the first ceremony that year where they're given to their family. So Jonas and Lily are not the natural children of this mother and father? They're not. Apparently, when they were ready, they applied to the committee. And at an annual ceremony, they were given their children a couple years apart. And only two, of course. One boy and one girl. Is that a rule? That's That's a a rule. rule. Wow. Well, Joan, speaking of rules, what did Jonas's father tell us about his role as a nurturer that day? Well, he was actually worried about the little male child who wasn't growing as rapidly as the other babies and he was a little concerned that if this baby didn't get growing fast he would be released you mean like the way the pilot was released well yes except jonas did tell us that newborn children or really old people could be released without it being a punishment what does the father the nurturer think he can do for this male child well the father is going to propose to the committee at work that he be allowed to bring this new child home with him at night to give him some extra supplementary nurturing in the hopes of having him catch up with his peers. And Lily jokes, of course, that that would be fun and maybe we could keep him. But her mother quickly reminds her, Lily, you know the rules. Well, Patrick, does Jonas ever share his feelings? Well, we realize that Jonas will be turning 12, and apparently at this age in the community, they are given their future assignment or job responsibility in the community. So he's a little apprehensive about what his job will be. Does his mother or father explain to him how this happens? Oh, yeah. They sit him down and explain to them, oh, of course, we had to go through our ceremony of 12s, too, and we were nervous. But Jonas, the committee, they've been observing you and all your other 11s for quite a few years now, and they're going to get the right job for you. So Jonas is reassured. But Patrick, Joan, before we get to this ceremony of 12, 
this family unit actually does get an addition. Well, Frank, everyone in the family did have to sign a document stating they would not get attached to this child and they would freely give him up when his time came. You're right. I accept the correction. (laughs) But Joan, the father does bring home this male new child. They call him Gabriel. That's right. Actually, the father has sneaked and found out that's what this child's name is going to be. There's a rule that new child's names are not supposed to be revealed until they're given to their new parents. So Jonas's father has broken a rule. It makes Jonas nervous because when one breaks a rule in this community, the whole community finds out about it through those speakers. Well, Joan, Jonas knows all about the embarrassment that can come from those speakers. He once brought home an apple from school. Well, the story is that Jonas was playing catch on the playground with his friend Asher with an apple. And the apple changed just for an instant in the air. And it so baffled him that he wanted to keep that apple. And he put the apple in his pocket and went home just staring at it. Patrick, is there a no playing catch with apple rule? No, but apparently there's a rule against taking apples home with you. Any food. Right. And later that evening, there was an announcement over the speakers. Which are in the home, too. Clearly directed at Jonas, although it didn't identify him by name, that this is a reminder to all male 11s. Objects are not to be removed from the recreation area and that snacks are to be eaten, not hoarded. So that gives you the idea that they're under constant observation. Well, Joan, rule or no rule, this whole family unit enjoyed having Gabriel with them. Right. They did seem to enjoy having a little infant around. But of course, they only had him at night. During the day, he went to the nurturing center while everyone went to their jobs or school. And Patrick, one of the things that each of the children do during the day after school is they're supposed to volunteer at one of the centers in town. It could be the nurturing center. It could be the child care center. The fish hatchery center. (laughs) (laughs) On one particular day, Jonas, with his friends Asher and Fiona, decide to spend some time at the House of the Old. We realize that these family units sort of have an expiration date because when the children become old enough to get their own jobs, then they go off into their own life. And they're given a spouse and then eventually given children. Then once the children are grown up, the parents apparently separate and move on to the home for childless adults. And once they're no longer productive adults, they'll then move on to the house of the olds. And Patrick, let's be clear. Once Jonas and Lily move on and start their own family units, they will also have no connection or relationship with the people they call their mother and father. Right. I suppose they could run into them one day somewhere, but there's no relationship. Joan, Jonas and his friends Asher and Fiona actually go to the House of the Old to spend the day volunteering. What are they doing? Well, they do whatever is necessary, and today is bathing day. And they bathe these old people, and as Jonas says, he loves to listen to them talk about their lives because he finds them funny and interesting, which I found strange because we know now that everyone pretty much has the exact same life. They can't imagine what's funny or interesting about these stories. Well, Patrick, they do have some excitement at the House of Old. In fact, one of the old women is telling Fiona and Jonas about a celebration they had had that morning celebrating the release of Roberto. That's right, and they describe it as being just a wonderful event. It sounded like a party. It did, and as Larissa describes it, well, there was a telling of his life. That is always first. Then the toast. We all raised our glasses and cheered. We chanted the anthem. He made a lovely goodbye speech, and several of us made little speeches wishing him well. He was thrilled. You should have seen the look on his face when they let him go. Well, Joan, it sounds like Jonas and his friends had a pretty good day at the House of the Old, but that day certainly leads to some, shall we say, unexpected consequences for Jonas. (laughs) Well, Jonas is an 11-year-old boy. And the next day, at the morning dream ritual... Different from the evening feelings ritual. Right. Apparently, in the morning at breakfast, every family member has to reveal their dreams from the previous night. Glad my mother didn't ask me about some of those dreams. (laughs) Well, Jonas was asked about his dream. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I think we better get Lily out of the room. As a matter of fact, the father says, why don't I take Lily to school today so mother can have a little talk with Jonas? The mother's going to have the talk? (laughs) Obviously, wears the pants in this family. (laughs) I know we're having some fun with this, but really, what's going on? (laughs) Well, what is happening is obviously very natural. Jonas is about that age. And so he had a dream about this girl And it's caused, as his mother refers to it, the stirrings. He's heard the word stirrings before, but it's always come out of a speaker, and it seems like an order. Attention, a reminder that stirrings must be reported in order for treatment to take place. So he thinks he may have some medical problem. 
Again, his mother reassures him that this is really no big deal. In fact, many of his friends may already be taking the treatment for the stirrings. You're ready for the pills, that's all. That's the treatment for the stirrings. In fact, Patrick, it turns out mother and father are taking these pills. They don't have stirrings. Correct. But for Jonas, he's just relieved to know that he's not different from everyone else in the community. And he moves on. Right, to the Ceremony of Twelves. Ah, the Ceremony of Twelve. I'm glad you mentioned that. And actually, we find out this is a two-day ceremony. Throughout the day, each age group is given a symbolic indication that they've now passed on to the next age group. We've already talked about the Ceremony for the Ones. That day, each new child is given his or her name and assigned to a family unit. Patrick, what do we know about some of the other age groups and their ceremony? Well, we don't know them all, but sevens get a jacket with buttons in the front. That's a big deal because up until you're a seven, your jacket buttons in the back so that you will learn interdependence with other members of your community. And the eights get a jacket with the buttons in front and pockets. Why pockets? Now they have to be responsible for their own things. That's right. And probably next to the twelves, the next most important ceremony is the ceremony of nines. What do the nines get? Bicycles. And as we said, bikes are really the main mode of transportation in this community. So getting your own bike and having that kind of freedom It is a big step. Right, and this two-day sort of celebration culminates with the most important thing, which is the ceremony of twelves. And that's what Jonas has been waiting for. Nervously waiting for. But wait, Joan, before we get to Jonas' ceremony of twelve, what family unit did Gabriel get assigned to? After all, this was his one ceremony, wasn't it? Well, it was supposed to be Gabriel's one, but it didn't turn out to be. Well, Joan, you mean he was released? No, although most new children, if they didn't thrive... By this point, they would have been released. As the book says, as a result of father's plea, Gabriel had been labeled uncertain and given an additional year. And the hope was that he would catch up and be assigned to a new family the next ceremony. But if not, then he would be released. Well, I am glad to hear that about Gabriel, but I think we've kept Jonas waiting long enough for his (laughs) ceremony of 12. Let's get back to it. Well, Joan, what are some of the assignments he doesn't get? Well, he doesn't become a fish hatchery attendant. He doesn't become an instructor of sixes, and he certainly doesn't become a birth mother. Which, as they remark, is a job without honor. Because that job is three years of complete pampering while you produce three children. Once you've produced your three children, you then become a laborer, and you do hard work until you move to the house of old. And finally, Jonas. Jonas has been selected to be the next receiver of memory. And still, he did not understand. And Patrick, at this point, I didn't understand. Well, they don't make clear exactly what the receiver of memory is. But we learn the receiver in training, which is what Jonas will be, is to be alone, apart, while he is prepared by the current receiver for the job, which is the most honored in the community. Jonas is getting a little nervous now. (laughs) Right, because they go on to tell him that as the receiver, he will have to have intelligence, integrity, courage, that this will be, at times, a painful training period. And they mention one other quality, which they don't really understand themselves, but it's referred to as the capacity to see beyond. And according to the current receiver of memory, Jonas has this quality. Although Jonas isn't so sure right at that moment. Well, actually, he is sure. He doesn't have this quality. (laughs) And then... And then it happened again. What happened again? That thing that happened with the apple when it was in the air, he looked out at the people in the audience, and it happened. Just for a minute, the people's faces changed. changed. But then he blinked, and it was gone. Mm -hmm. But that moment gave him sureness, as the novel Mm -hmm. says, I think it's true. I don't understand it yet, he said, but sometimes I see something, and maybe it's beyond. And with that, Jonas accepts his new rule book and heads back to his dwelling. And it's finally when Jonas is alone in his room that he opens up his training manual, and he's very surprised to see that there's only one page in it. That's right, but then he's even more shocked by what he reads in his training manual. What does he read? Well, there are only eight rules in his manual. The first two have to do with his hours of training, when he goes and when he comes. And then rule three says, From this moment you may ask any question of any citizen, and you will receive answers. Rule four says, Do not discuss your training with any other member of the community, including parents and elders. Well, there goes the evening ritual. In number five, from this moment, you are prohibited from dream telling. Well, there goes the morning ritual, too. Hmm. Number six, except for illness or injury unrelated to your training, 
do not apply for any medication. Hmm, I guess you can still take the anti-stirring pills. Yeah, but it sounds like training might be dangerous. Hmm. Number seven, you are not permitted to apply for release. Of course, you couldn't imagine anybody applying for release. Right, but apparently it was a right. Hmm. And finally, and most shockingly, number eight, you may lie. Wow, this is opposite of everything he's learned for the last 12 years. This must be some job. Right, and you start to get a sense of the intelligence of this boy when he quickly begins to think about it, and he thinks, well, can other people lie? Does his mother and father lie? And yet he realizes, even though I can ask, because I'm exempted from the rules of rudeness, I would never know if they were telling me the truth. Well, Joan, after seeing the eight rules in his training manual, I can't wait to go with Jonas on his first day of training. He goes to meet the old receiver in a locked room. He had never seen locks before. And in his dwelling and every other dwelling in the community, the furniture was quite functional and plain. In the receiver's room, there were curved legs to the table and there was curtains on the wall and there were books from floor to ceiling. Certainly he had seen books before. Well, he'd seen the dictionary that was in everybody's home, and he'd seen the Book of Rules. But as the novel continues, Jonas only had a second to look around because he was aware that the man sitting in the chair beside the table was watching him. Hastily, he moved forward, stood before the man, bowed slightly, and said, I'm Jonas. And the old man says, I know. Welcome, receiver of memory. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. Jonas is a little confused about being called or referred to as the receiver of memory. He thinks that's what this gentleman is. But the man says to him, beginning today, this moment, at least to me, you are the receiver. And he goes on to tell Jonas that he's glad that he's been selected. He's anxious to begin his training because he points out to Jonas that he had failed in his attempt to train the previous receiver of memory. So as a result, it's very important that Jonas's training go well. He's been at this job at least 10 years too long. And a crucially important job for this community because he tells Jonas, my job is to transmit to you all the memories I have within me, memories of the past, the memories of the whole world before you, before me, before the previous receiver, and generations before him. This really confuses Jonas now. He doesn't know what he means by the whole world or generations before him. That's right. He tells the old man, I thought there was only us. I thought there was only now. And the old receiver responds, there is much more. There's all that goes beyond, all that is elsewhere. But he can see that Jonas still isn't understanding, so he starts to give him an analogy. He says, there's so much I have to tell you and give you. You know, it's like being on a sled. You're picking up speed and you're going down the hill and then the sled runs into more and more snow and it gets harder and harder to push yourself through. And Jonas just looks at him with a blank stare. Eventually it does occur to the old man that he's using words that Jonas has no concept of. He says, you don't understand. You don't know what snow is, do you? Well, it's a place to start. How's that going to happen? The old man puts his hands on his back and starts transmitting a memory of sled riding on a hill. And slowly, Jonas has this memory. He also gains the knowledge that comes with it. All of a sudden, he realizes what this thing is that he's sitting on, which is a sled. And he realized he's sitting at the top of a hill. All these words suddenly he knew and understood. The cold came to him. He shivered. He could feel it. The pain of the snow hitting his skin. And the joy and exhilaration of the speed 
and the air rushing by came the to fun. him. fun. That's right. And yet, through it all, he knew still that he was in a room with the old man receiving this memory. Patrick, this was a good experience for the old man as well. Right. The old man says that it had been exhausting, but you know, even transmitting that tiny memory to you, I think it lightened me just a little. Now the questions are pouring out of him. Do you not have that memory anymore? Did I take it from you? All I gave you was one ride on one sled in one snow on one hill. I have a whole world of them in my memory, and I could give them to you a thousand times, and there would still be more. Now this is a thought that really excites Jonas. You mean we could do that again? You know, I think I could steer that sled by pulling on the rope. <laughs> <laughs> and then he starts asking deeper questions. Why don't we have snow? And did we in the past? And the old man says, climate control. Snow made growing food difficult, and unpredictable weather made transportation almost impossible at times. It wasn't a practical thing. So it became obsolete when we went to sameness. And the old man continued, And the hills, too, they made conveyance of goods unwieldy. Trucks, buses, slowed them down. So flat sameness. But Jonas right away says, I wish we still had those things. And the old man smiled. So do I, he said. But that choice is not ours. But he told him it was time to go home. But before Jonas leaves, he has one more question for the old man. Yeah, he doesn't know what to call him. If Jonas is the receiver, then what is he? Call me the giver. And that's what he does. Over the next few weeks, the giver passes on a lot of memories to Jonas. He passes on some very painful memories of things like war, hunger, disease, and of course a lot of pleasant memories. Things like Christmas and actually family gatherings. And grandparents. Right, the previous generation to his parents is unthinkable to Jonas. They don't exist in this society. Right. And he also discovers colors. And for Jonas, color explains what he was seeing in that apple and in the people's faces. Mm -hmm. And beyond red, he finally learns that there's blues and greens and yellows. Mm -hmm. And Patrick, Joan, as Jonas continues to gain these memories, He's learning more and more just what his society doesn't have, what they're missing. That's right, and now he appreciates how lonely and difficult is the job of the receiver. These ideas and concepts, he can't share at all with the community. They have no idea what these feelings or these pleasures or these pains are. But he does find one person in the community who's receptive to his memories. But by accident. Mm -hmm. One night, Jonas goes into Gabriel's room where he's having difficulty sleeping, and he's patting his back, and without realizing it, he's thinking of a peaceful sail on a calm lake, and Gabriel begins to quiet down and go to sleep. And he realizes that he's just imparted this memory to Gabriel. But Joan, except for Gabriel, over the next few months, Jonas has no connection at all with anyone else in his society. He can't tell them what he's going through. He can't tell them what he's experiencing. Right, nothing. And it's this loneliness, this depression, that really starts him thinking about what happened to the former receiver. And the giver tells him, well, she asked for her release, and we had to give it to her. And it was a disaster for the community. Why was the release of the previous receiver a disaster for the community? Well, apparently the memories that the receiver holds when they leave the community, they're released back into the community, and everyone in the community can experience these memories so difficult and foreign for them. Right, memories they're not prepared for. Exactly. And even though the previous receiver only had about five weeks of memories, it took a long time for the community to get over those memories. And Patrick, it's this news that really got Jonas starting to think about release. In fact, his father had just told him that they had released an undersized twin baby just that morning. And the giver asked Jonas, do you want to see this morning's release? I think you should. Apparently all these ceremonies are recorded on video, and the giver can call them up at any time and view them. And so, though a little bit nervous, Jonas readies himself to watch his father release the twin. And Joan, what does he see? He sees his father give the baby a lethal injection and neatly dispose of him. All the while singing and humming. Mm -hmm. Right, and as the baby goes down the garbage chute, he says, bye-bye, little guy. And Patrick, as Lowry writes, Jonas felt a ripping sensation inside himself. The feeling of terrible pain clawing its way forward to emerge in a cry. And Jonas refuses to go home that night. But it also gives him an idea. And it's an idea the giver has long cherished as well. The two of them come up with a plan that will allow all the memories to go back into the community. They all can share them. They'll all grow in wisdom. And the giver will help them deal with it. But for that to work, Jonas has to leave the community. But let's be clear, we're not talking about Jonas releasing himself. No, the plan will be for him to physically leave from the community. And go elsewhere, right. which is a place neither Jonas or the giver or anyone has ever been. 
In fact, they're not sure if it exists. So for the next couple of weeks, the giver is going to give Jonas every memory he can of strength and courage. But they don't get those extra weeks. It turns out Jonas has to leave tonight. Right, because he did go home the next day. And he learned through his father that Gabriel, who was just not thriving, was going to be released the next morning. And now that Jonas knows what release is, there's no way he's going to let that happen to Gabriel. That's right. So that night, with no planning or preparation, without even telling the giver, he takes Gabriel and leaves the community by bicycle. Jonas is headed to elsewhere. Right, and he quickly pedals through some outlying communities and then finds himself on these long stretches of empty roads, and soon he's in a wilderness area. But all the while, he's been avoiding the search planes of the community. Basically traveling at night, sleeping during the day. And he avoids the heat detectors of the plane by using his memories of cold for he and Gabriel so the planes can't find him. And conversely, when necessary, using his memories of warmth to keep them warm. Yeah. Right, and after days of this, he notices he sees fewer and fewer planes, and then one day there are no planes searching for him. But Patrick, the biggest change that Jonas notices is hills. The sameness has ended. Is this elsewhere? Well, he encounters waterfalls and wildlife. And he eventually encounters real snow. And he's also experiencing real hunger and real fear. This is not just the stuff of memories anymore. Right, and his ability to rely on the memories he was given have almost faded. Right, it's been days since they've eaten, and it's very cold out, and they find themselves in a snowstorm, freezing. And Joan, having used all his memories of warmth... Really, the final memory that Jonas has and that he can share with Gabriel is really the first memory he received, the memory of that sled ride. Or is it a real sled ride? That's right. And as our novel ends, Lowry writes, Jonas felt himself losing consciousness and with his whole being willed himself to stay upright atop the sled, clutching Gabriel, keeping him safe. The runners sliced through the snow and the wind whipped at his face as they sped in a straight line through an incision that seemed to lead to the final destination. The place that he had always felt was waiting. The elsewhere that held their future and their past. And that is how our novel, The Giver, by Lois Lowry, ends. But there are some questions. Yeah, I can think of a couple myself. <laughs> was that a real sled? Did they really get to elsewhere? Or was that just Jonas's first and final memory? Well, the author leaves the ending to the reader's interpretation. What about the community that Jonas left? Do they get his memories back? Well, Frank, that's another question left for the reader to decide. All right. So, Patrick, Joan, let's move on and talk about what we do know about this novel. We couldn't get to every situation and we couldn't get to every character. So if you have a moment you want to tell us about or maybe a quote you want to read, now's your opportunity. Joan, do you have something? Yes. There's just a short exchange between Jonas and the giver when Jonas is learning about color and the color of his clothes. It reads, he looked down at himself, at the colorless fabric of his clothing. But it's always the same, always. Then he laughed a little. I know it's not important what you wear. It doesn't matter, but it's the choosing that's important, isn't it? The giver asked him. And right then and there, Jonas learns how important it is to control your own life. Mm -hmm. Patrick, do you have something? There was a passage following a memory that Jonas received about love and family the scene with the grandparents in a home with a warm fire. And that night when he goes home to his parents, he asks them, Mother, Father, do you love me? There was an awkward silence for a moment. The father gave a little chuckle. Jonas, you of all people, precision of language, please. And Jonas asked, well, what do you mean? Your father means that you used a very generalized word, so meaningless that it has become almost obsolete, his mother explained. And of course, our community can't function smoothly if people don't use precise language. You could ask, do you enjoy me? The answer is yes, his mother said. Or, his father suggested, do you take pride in my accomplishments? And the answer is wholeheartedly yes. Do you understand why it's inappropriate to use a word like love, mother asked? Jonas nodded, yes, thank you, I do, he replied slowly. It was his first lie to his parents. And this passage just sort of illustrates the very sterile relationship that exists between not just Jonas and his parents, but between all the people in this community. And that was when Jonas really began to realize he can no longer live as a part of this community. Or at the very least, that from this moment on, his life was going to be very different in this community. And forever sad, unless something changed. I agree. And that's why I wanted to focus on a moment that I thought was a little happier, a little lighter. Jonas's recounting for the giver, the first hints he had that there was something 
different about him was when he started to get flashes of color. Mm-hmm. As they were throwing the apple, he saw a little red. And as he looked out in the crowd, he saw colors in some of the faces. He asked the giver, is that how it was for you? And the giver says, no, for me, it was not seeing beyond. It was hearing beyond. And Jonas asks, well, what did you hear? Music, the giver said, smiling. I began to hear something truly remarkable, and it is called music. I'll give you some before I go. Hmm. And I just thought that was a very nice moment. But, of course, the sad part, Frank, is he only has the memories of music. He's never actually heard music. That's right. That's true. And it made me wonder, would I rather live without color or without music? And I'm still not sure. (laughs) Right. Me neither. But I want to tell you one other thing about an incredible experience I had when I was reading this book. I was in the middle of it and was interrupted by something and had to go away from the book. And as I was getting ready to go back to it, I thought, oh, I can't wait to get back to my receiving It just came to my head, and I realized reading is like receiving, and the author is like a giver. And we're all better for the memories we've read. I think so. And it's with that we'll end our conversation today about the novel, The Giver, by Lois Lowry. I want to thank you both for coming in and having this conversation with me today. I enjoyed doing it, Frank. You're welcome, Frank. I'll be joined by our researcher, Ted Schwartz, for endnotes on today's conversation. Hello, Ted. Hi, Frank. Ted, of course Lois Lowry named her book The Giver. And that refers to the old man in the novel who passes on the memories and old truths of the civilization to the young boy. But if Lois Lowry wrote her autobiography, I understand she would probably call it The Liar? Yes, she was delighted from the time she was a little girl, I'm talking about five years old, to discover the power of a lie. For example, her grandfather would take Lois and her older sister, set them on his lap, and then read them poetry way beyond their years. Her sister honestly announced, I'm bored, and left. Lois discovered by lying when he asked her if she understood or liked it and said, oh, yes, that she'd get more attention from grandfather, and that delighted her. Well, Ted, I think every child can understand telling a white lie to get a reward from a parent or a grandparent. But I understand by the time she was eight, she was making up stories for her own enjoyment. Yes, when she got bored, for example, she had to take her little brother for a walk in a stroller, she would start narrating the experience adding whatever dramatic information was needed, like she was doing it because her mother was seriously ill. And then as an aside, she said, well, my mom did say she had a slight headache. (laughs) And of course, once she started making up stories, she must have sought out an audience for those stories. She did. She was at summer camp, and she wanted a little more attention from the older girls who were all college students who were the counselors. So she began talking about her older brother, non-existent, who went to Princeton, which was very, very special, and how he was going to come and visit. And she had the counselors avidly anticipating the arrival of this Princeton brother who tragically, by the time camp was over, never had a chance to get out there. (laughs) Well, Ted, let's get back to her novel, The Giver. What does Lowry tell us her impetus for writing The Giver was? Well, Lowry claims that her father became seriously ill and for five months had absolutely no memory of the past. That fascinated her. She noticed that there was no pain. You don't remember those things you regret. And, of course, no joy. And that was the other issue. So she began to think about a society in which this kind of experience existed. But, Ted, can we believe Lois Lowry? Has she ever lied to you? (laughs) Good point. And that's where we'll end today's end notes on our conversation today about the novel, The Giver, by Lois Lowry. I want to thank you for coming in and bringing us that information to us. You're welcome, Frank. I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, We dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon.
This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.